Dr. Simmons, thank you for joining me. I'm Dr. Shields and, uh, you know, Dr. Simmons, I know you've been with me now for seven years and I know you've seen thousands of patients over these last seven years. And it's just, interestingly enough, you've kind of seemed to fall into becoming our gut doctor. Like that seems to be your niche. And I remember asking you a few years ago, like, what do you feel like you really navigate towards? What do you feel like, what kind of people do you really feel like you can help? And you said digestive problems. So, um, you know, it's been, it's been really cool to see that's kind of evolved over the years from, if you could share with us, what kind of things are you seeing and what kind of people are you helping? Well, I mean, we see a lot of pa patients with like very long-standing digestive complaints and, and many people really just feel like it's something that is normal for them. Like after I eat, I get tired or every time I eat, I'm bloated. And my friends say the same thing. And it's like, it's just really hallmark signs that there's things that aren't going on well. I mean, what inherently should happen is we eat food and we feel good. We feel energetic. We don't feel like we have to take a nap or bog down or like our stomach's going to explode afterwards. And I mean, I have patients tell me after they eat, they feel like they're they look pregnant and I can actually visually see things. And it's like, that's, those are all hallmark, hallmarks of just things not going on as they should in the digestive system. And I guess probably the most common um, symptom that I hear is, is heartburn. You know, after I eat, I feel acid or I taste acid or I'm told I have GERD. And, you know, that is, is so common. And I feel like for most people, it's being treated in the exact opposite way in which it should. And that's going to be by taking things that reduce stomach acid. Uh, like proton pump inhibitors, omeprazole, Prilosec, Tums, things that neutralize that acid that your body creates to really make sure that it can digest food for you. Without well, hang, that. On, hang on for a second. Yes, I, what I understand is that heartburn, like we, if we watch on the commercials, it says heartburn is caused because of too much acid in our stomachs and then we need to lower the acid. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of confused why, exactly. why that wouldn't be the right solution for this problem. Okay. Well, I mean, for one thing to think about is making stomach acid a very, very concentrated chemical is not an easy thing to do. And the body doesn't generally just haphazardly make too much of a chemical. More often than not, when people feel heartburn, it's because their stomach acid levels are too low. And that seems counterintuitive because it's like, hey, I taste acid, so it must be that there's too much acid. Now, don't get me wrong. When acid comes into contact with your esophagus, even not as acidic of stomach acid as what should be, is still way too acidic to come into contact with your esophagus. It will burn that tissue. So if this is going on, that's where for a short period of time, taking like a proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole, that'll allow for an esophagus to heal and so on. So in cases of urgency, that's where those medications are used. But so many people use that medication for their entire lives. I mean, you can go to Costco and pick up proton pump inhibitors that used to be prescriptives. And when they're used chronically, what it really does is it pours fuel on the fire because not enough stomach acid means not digesting um, as well as what you're supposed to as the way nature or God intended, depending on what you choose to, to think. And it's like, you know, that's, it's completely deviating the normal mode of operation um, as far as digestive goes. Um, when stomach acid levels are low, then in turn, when we get food into our intestines, we don't have enough pancreatic enzymes, we don't have enough bile because stomach acid cues that process to occur. And then when we don't digest our food quickly as we're supposed to, then bacteria gets a chance to digest it for us. And okay. one thing that we don't always, you know, aren't always aware of is that when you feel bowel gas, when you feel bloating, it's because bacteria is digesting food that you should have. When you don't break down your fats, your proteins or carbohydrates, bacteria will ferment that. And fermentation is a process we're, we're familiar with if you, know, you brew um, beer or wine, but if you've ever even left like juice on the counter for too long, what happens when you open it? You hear that pss, and it's like, yep. that's, that's fermentation, that's gas that's built because bacteria is starting to digest those sugars. Well, when that's happening in the GI tract excessively, we feel it. We don't feel very well. We feel like our stomach's pushing out. And when that's happening up high in the small intestine, they call it SIBO, which is a term that gets thrown around, but it's, a, it's an acronym and it's spelled, I suppose you could say, S-I-B-O. It stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And that's what happens when there's not enough st stomach acid present for a long period of time. Bacteria ascends, moves up too high in the digestive system and starts to take, get a crack at your food before you do. So, oh, and that, no, I'm sorry. So, so go back to the reflux then. So if we've got reflux, somebody's uh -huh. taking a medication for the reflux. Yes. That's going to lower the stomach acid. Correct. That can then create a situation where bacteria can overgrow. Correct. And then, so now we have heartburn, but now we lead it into a, a, a 
another problem called SIBO. Yes. Yes, sir. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so the heartburn long standing, I think, is something that you have to have before you can get SIBO or taking stomach acid medication like Tomiprilosec, what have you. And that's something that really helps to set the stage for this bacteria in the small intestine to start to really take flight because there's an abundant amount of fuel for this bacteria to digest that you should be absorbing before bacteria ever gets a chance to. If your pancreas and your gallbladder and your stomach acid are doing what it's supposed to do, you absorb all of your macros, your fats, your proteins, your carbohydrates very, very quickly. And the only thing that's left over is fiber, which is supposed to be fermented by bacteria. And that should happen down lower. That's why, you know, beans are the magical fruit and why having you know a lot of vegetables make us feel gassy. And that's normal. And that's supposed to be. But when it's, when I have rice, I'm bloated or I'm Think, think I'm allergic to peas. You know, I hear that all the time. It's like, I think I have an allergy to rice. It's like, no, it's like, that's just a carb that's making you feel terrible. And it's not because there's an allergy, it's because bacteria is, is making you feel poorly. So it makes sense that you would think that it's a bad food for you, but it's more so the issue in the digestive system. So with reflux, I've also heard people say it's caused because of a bacteria called H. pylori, and they do breath tests and they have other testing for it. So, sir. How is H. pylori different than heartburn that's from too little or too much acid? Good question. So stomach acid, if it, well, let's go back. H. pylori is called an acidophile. It's a bacteria that loves acidic conditions. But if the stomach is acidic as it should be, it's too acidic for bacteria to thrive, propagate, to live. When stomach acid isn't as acidic as it should be is where it really hits that pH where it can take off. And when H. pylori in the stomach, the actual anatomic stomach itself takes off, it can start to irritate the lining of the, the stomach. We call it gastritis, like inflammation of the stomach. And if it really gets a chance to take root, it'll start to cause little ulcerations, um, basically holes in the protective lining of the stomach. And that's where stomach acid can start to damage the muscle of the stomach, the actual muscle inside. And that's where acutely, short term, few weeks, few months at a time, you got to take a proton pump inhibitor, um, omeprazole, prilosec, just to allow for the stomach to repair itself because that acid has gotten into an area where it was never intended to get to. And that's that short term. And that's what those medications were designed for. But unfortunately, if you go to your primary care physician and you have a, a GI complaint, it's kind of like the only tool that they have in their bag of tricks. Like here's omeprazole. I can't tell you how many patients tell me, hey, I went in to the, you know, the urgent care because my stomach was killing me and I left with omeprazole. I've been taking that for three years. Did it help? Well, a little bit, but now things are worse or it didn't help at all, but I'm just still taking it because, I mean, it happens so often. And I mean, it's, they're just doing what, all that they can do. Um, but- Funny you say that. I remember I had a patient, it seems like it sometimes, it seems like these uh, omeprazoles are their, their, their bag of trick if they really don't know what to do. I remember I had a patient, they were having asthma and they're like, take omeprazole. I had another patient had a- um, yeah. I had, had um, um, a lot of sinus infections, like, you know what, just take a meprazole. They're like, I don't have heartburn, but they, well, maybe it'll help. And so it's kind of like they just give it because I think they think it's probably the, the drug that does the least amount of harm, maybe, or I don't know what yeah, the odds yeah. are there. But Well, I mean, and GERD manifests in so many different ways. Um, heartburn, okay. GERD, gastroesophageal reflux. I mean, it can feel like a heart attack. It can feel like anxiety. I mean, if you have pain in the middle of your chest, that, and that causes a state of urgency, a panic. Um, so, I mean, it, it covers a lot of bases, but still, more often than not, the issue is, is that there's not enough stomach acid and omeprazole is just going to maybe take the edge off of the symptom of acid getting where it shouldn't be. But the problem is still that there's not enough acid where it should be in the stomach and helping us digest. So with your treatments and when you're helping patients, what do you feel like is the biggest differentiator between what you're doing for them? How, how are you able to help those people with the heartburn not have heartburn anymore? And, and, well, and again, the, especially if they've been taking the drug for a long time, like how do they... Yeah. Well, I mean, if someone has gastritis or actually has ulcers, you got to heal the stomach first before you can do anything. You got to get that under control, put that fire out. And then you give the body some stomach acid, which um, you take in the way of supplementation, betaine, HCL, some digestive enzymes, just to make sure that we're breaking down our food, fueling natural stomach acid production. Now, long term, like your mother used to say, eat your vegetables. I mean, when we eat a diet that is very, very alkaline, as odd as it sounds, it helps us to make stomach acid. And that goes down a whole rabbit hole that we just don't have time to get into. But eating vegetables helps us to make more stomach acid, or at least eating a very alkaline diet. Um, acidic foods, coffee, alcohol, meats, that 
causes us to lose stomach acid. And that's where you'll get a lot of, of heartburn and GERD from having this. Like you tell you how many people say, hey, I had coffee and then I would get heartburn or becoming excessively stressed. That's another thing that can tend to deplete, deplete stomach acid levels. And how many people have experienced where hey, I felt really stressed and all of a sudden I felt that heartburn. And it's just you know, getting down a rabbit hole that, that we don't want you to do in the moment, but it's definitely a very, very common uh, occurrence. Okay, well, thank you. On the SIBO aspect, I know that's a big sure. term I hear about, hear a lot more about. I actually had a patient that came from U of M and they mm -hmm. diagnosed with SIBO and yeah. them, uh, some, some treatments and they were still here. What, in, in your thoughts, what, what are some of the biggest mistakes that are being made right now with SIBO? And what, what are you doing differently? Or let's well, start with the biggest mistakes. Yeah, I mean, there's not really any treatment for it. I mean, the most common treatment for irritable bowel syndrome or SIBO is antidepressants, low dose antidepressants. And they do that just to really take the edge off of pain. Um, one kind of unknown um, component of the digestive system is that it uses and creates more serotonin than the brain does. So when we have chronic long-standing stress on the gut, we lose serotonin, which will definitely not only have an effect on how we feel um, GI wise, but how we feel psychologically. Yeah, the brain, the brain, the brain, uh, brain, brain gut connection. Yeah, the brain. Yeah, absolutely. Gain. Yeah. So, so with, this, with the SIBO, um, it, what are some of the symptoms somebody might have? Because I, I know a lot of people out there might have it, not even know they have it. Like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, how do you know, how do you know if you have question. SIBO? So the most common symptom, and you don't have to have all of these, but definitely the most common symptom is going to be bloating in less than forty minutes after eating. Okay. So if you eat and you're bloated right away, that means that there's bacteria somewhere that it shouldn't be. I mean, what okay. should happen is chew, swallow, sit in the stomach, 15, 20 minutes, things start to descend into the small intestine, which should be sterile, made so because you have a lot of stomach acid, it changes the pH so that normal bacteria that would live in the colon can't live there. Um, when SIBO is present, that fermentation happens almost instantaneously. Um, another hallmark indication of SIBO is when you can distend your stomach will actually distend to the point where you can see it clothing yeah, all the time. fitting differently especially like up high like right underneath the ribs that's an area we shouldn't have bloating now don't get me wrong if you have a lot of beans you're going to be bloated down lower but that's going to be hours after you eat and that's to be expected from that food but when you have foods that aren't really high in fiber you know your rice potatoes I mean those those are carby foods but they're not like like dense fibrous beans or, you know, even like celery and so on. Not to say that those are bad foods, but you, you just kind of anticipate the bloating. So uh, we mentioned the, you know, immediate bloating, the volume of distension is really a big one. And then now this is down the road, but oftentimes I see it kind of spill over into anxiety. I mean, you have that physiologic anxiety, whereas basically every time you eat, uh, if you have SIBO, bacteria levels plume, the immune system says, hey, there's something going on here. I need to fight this. The immune system reacts. And then your body feels that anxiety because there's an immune response. There's something urgent that's going on. So that's kind of down the road, but oftentimes you'll see that stress, anxiety um, start to kick in. Now I know um, that the decreased stomach acid can lead to the bacteria getting from the, from the, the foods and the food that we're eating that's getting into the gut and that can allow the overgrowth to occur because it wasn't killed in the, in the acid, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and the we, other didn't, way, we didn't mention that. That's a good point. Yeah. And the other way that the body can get that overgrowth of bacteria, if we understand too, is that constipation. Like if people have constipation, that bacteria can then flush back up into the small intestines. Yeah. Now, there's two different types of bacteria that can cultivate in the small intestine. Okay. One, one produces hydrogen as, as an off gas, like um, the bloating, basically. The fermentation produces hydrogen. That's a whole class of bacteria. And that bacteria is perce perceived by the immune system as food poisoning. Okay, now when we have food poisoning, what happens, we go to the bathroom right away. Your body's like, get this out of me right now. So that'll be more like IBSD, irritable bowel syndrome with diarrhea. Now, a second type of back, group of bacteria rather, has to have hydrogen present to, to live, to propagate. But once it does start to live in the small intestine, that creates methane gas. And that methane gas causes a seizing effect on the intestines, and that causes constipation. Like if you or I were to swallow a gulp of methane gas, we'd be constipated for a few days. It's just the, the direct effect of that gas. Well, when bacteria is making that every time we eat or every time we eat something that fuels its, that bacterial growth, we're constipated a lot. And that's IBS-C, okay. irritable bowel syndrome with constipation. And there's a breath test that'll let us know which bacteria, if 
or if both are present. And that really helps to let us know what types of botanicals, what type of diet is gonna be best suited, best tailored for an individual patient. And if you do the right diet and the wrong type of botanicals, that's not gonna work. If you do the right botanicals and the wrong diet, it won't work. I mean, you gotta be very, very surgical about your approach or else you can put a lot of effort out there and not get benefit. Explain botanicals to me, because in case somebody else is listening to this, they, they might have heard that term yeah. and not really understand so, what you mean by that. Yeah, so so natural, naturally occurring chemicals, generally coming from, from herbs, plants, and so on. Some that we use in the treatment of SIBO would be like berberine, golden seal, oregano, thyme, sage. These are all natural antimicrobials that have been presented to us from nature, and they can help us get better as well. Garlic's a really big one as well, or at least extracts thereof. And I mean, they've been shown to be every bit as beneficial as a lot of very strong, very concerning types of medications. It's just, you have to be diligent with them. It takes a lot more work than a medication would. Yes, sir. So what I understand then is you're, what you were saying then is some people are doing maybe the right diet, but the wrong botanicals. They're doing the wrong botanicals or the right botanicals and the wrong diet. Yeah, they can work both ways. And I mean, it's, you might, and the other thing is with just strictly diet alone, it takes a long time to get over any type of digestive ailment, but SIBO in particular. I mean, it could take months to years and every little misstep in the way of the diet can set you back for weeks to months. Um, whereas our treatment really helps to make sure that you get a little more wiggle room. I mean, you still take some diligence. I mean, you got to really want to get better, but um, it makes it so that what might have taken six months or a year can be achieved in a couple of weeks. Okay. Um, yeah. So the last thing in is diarrhea. What are some of the common causes that I know that we just discussed that SIBO can actually sometimes present itself as constipation SIBO, yeah. or diarrhea, but what other causes have you seen with your lab work and your testing that cause diarrhea? Well, I mean, moving out of the small intestine lower into the large intestine or the colon, um, when there's pathogens, which pathogens is a pretty strict global term, but if you have you know overgrowth of certain bacteria, if you have any type of yeast, candida, parasites, anything that the body doesn't like being there, that's something that when we eat, when fiber levels come up, all bacteria gets a chance to eat, right? And if we have bacteria there that is just below our immunological radar, all of a sudden those levels come up and now the body says, hey, I don't like what's going on here. We need to get rid of this. It's again, acting like there's food poisoning. You know, I mean, when we have food poisoning, what happens? We ingest the bacteria, the body says, hey, this shouldn't be here. Get it out of me right now. Well. The same thing can happen chronically in the large intestine if there's bacteria that's always there, always hanging on, not quite enough to cause us to have loose bowel movements one day, but then maybe this meal is enough to bring the levels up to the point where it's like, all right, that's enough. That brings me to that other question then of when you, because we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, you were just telling me that somebody brought in their lab work from their doctor mm -hmm. and they, they showed you their stool test and you were kind of like, little bit surprised they're not surprised but you're like yeah they only tested and explain that to me again what, what are most doctors so, looking for when they I mean, go to the stool testing more often than not they're looking for h pylori and c diff they're looking for those two things and those are two things that are worth looking for for sure the problem is a lot of people's issues aren't they have this immediate urgent bacterial overgrowth um, or one of a handful different types of bacteria or parasites that get looked at oftentimes there's an issue of dysbiosis which the term kind of breaks down into wrong bacteria, dis, wrong bacteria. Um, and that has to do with like the harmony of the bacteria within the gut, within the GI tract. And, you know, you gotta have a lot of different type of bacteria to give you versatility towards not having infections occur. If you're taking like only acidophilus all the time, that means you're gonna have a ton of acidophilus probiotic um, in the intestines. But what if you have something that is competitive with or fights off acidophilus, you don't have that tolerance. So you have to really, really work at building a good, strong, healthy microbiome. And that helps to make sure that this balance is achieved and that particular um, yeast or bacteria so, don't get so a chance you, to propagate. Yep. So you look at the microbiome, you look at the bacteria, what's with that bacteria? So that's one of your parts of your test. And sure. what else do you like? To, I mean, I, I know that our testing is five pages long versus two tests. Right. So, well, looks, so we, we do a, a test called the GI map, which what I think you're alluding to, and it looks for you no know, pathogens, major pathogens like you would get from your, uh, your primary care physician. It looks for good bacteria, whether there's enough. It looks for bad bacteria, things that are not onto themselves enough to send you to the emergency room, but enough where if the bacteria levels start to rise too much, we'll feel that every day 
fogginess, swelling, brain fog. I mean, just the immune system's kind of there. Like if you can picture the first um, day of getting a cold, you know, like before you're sick, you kind of know something's going on. And the next day you, you get a scratchy throat. You're like, ah, that's it. I knew it. That's kind of what this dysbiosis feels like. Um, it goes on to yeast. Yeast overgrowth is going to be something that a lot of people deal with. We see that with like even with children in the way of like thrush um, in the mouth or like versicolor, light spots on the skin and so on. Um, but that's a very, very common overgrowth in the GI tract. Generally, it's going to be propagated by excessive carbohydrate intake, uh, which I think we're all guilty of from time to time. But um, something yeah. we want to definitely keep under uh, under control. Um, and then, and the parasites, which, I mean, no one wants to talk about it, but parasites are much more abundant than anyone is aware of. Um, they're, they're present often. And I mean, we're, we're carnivores. There's not any other carnivore on earth that isn't known to have parasites. We just tend to think, oh, because we cook our food all the time, we never have them, but that's, that's far from the truth. So okay. we don't know what we don't know, which is why that's a great test. Um, I will tell you though, if you have that, those upper symptoms, you know, it's SIBO and you, you got to start there, but the lower ones are the ones that get to be really chronic and just kind of take out the joy to be, uh, take away the brightness of life. So I know you also like to do food sensitivity testing too, because yeah. you've seen that correlate with. Well, I mean, and the big question I get from a lot of patients is why, why do I have this? Why do I have SIBO? Why do I have dysbiosis? Oftentimes there's some underlying stressor that's going on. And that's where the food sensitivity gets to be very important because if you're eating a food and your body's essentially perceiving that as being a bacteria, that's going to exhaust the immune system. That's going to cause inflammation. That's going to cause some permeability in the gut. And as that happens, it opens the door to infections occurring. So we got to make sure that there isn't a, a monkey on your back that, that may be primed, set the stage. So if somebody's watching this right now, they're suffering with IBS, IBD, they've got gas, bloating, constipation, they've got heartburn. When they seek help from a, a naturopath, a, um, a functional medicine practitioner, what do you think is important for them to look for and to make sure they're getting the right kind of care and treatment? Make sure they're testing. I mean, make sure there's testing that's being done to identify what their problem is. Because if it's just, hey, here are your symptoms and this is going to be good for you, it's like, no one can say with absolute certainty what someone's problem is from listening to symptoms. You can listen and you can have a pretty good idea, but if you don't test, you don't really know what's going on. Okay. Um, and you might, you might get lucky from time to time. And if you're, you know, really good, you might get lucky half the time, but it's like, if you have the right testing, if you listen and then perform the right test, you're going to get the right treatment all the time. Well, you know, Dr. Simmons, I've always known you to be a very humble man, uh, but always been striving to be a better version of yourself and always studying and working really hard to really help your patients. And I really appreciate that. And I know your patients do too. And if you don't mind sharing with us a little bit though, from when you started with me seven years ago to where you're at today, what would you tell yourself seven years ago or what were some of the mistakes you might've made? And let's be honest with people, let them know, you know, Hey, yeah. Yeah, I know you're not perfect. And I know we're still not perfect, but if you had to look back at that Dr. Simmons to this, today's Dr. Simmons, what would you think that were maybe some of the mistakes or some of maybe your approach has changed? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, learning how to listen, how to let people tell you what's wrong with them. And that's a big one. I mean, we, we tend to go, go in and just feel like we know what's best. But if you listen to a person talk, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. You just know how, have to know how to listen and, you know, what, and know what questions to ask for sure. Um, and experience and learning, right? I mean, when you see something or have something go wrong in the past, you don't make that mistake ever again. You have to, you have to kind of learn through the process. And I, I guess what I would say to my my former self is, it's going to be a rough ride for a little bit, but you're going to get better. Stick with it. And you know, <laughs> you know what's funny is I'm listening to you. That answer is so perfect because I've always told people that you're one of the best listeners in the entire world. <laughs> and if there's one thing I can learn from you is how to be a better listener. And that's exactly I think that's funny. Dr. Simmons, you've always been a great listener. Uh, you really have, but I, I, I understand what you mean. It's, it is really taking that time to listen to people, and they will tell you the story and to probably tell you what, what, what the cause of the problem is if you listen long enough. So, yeah, I really appreciate your time. I know you have to go. I know you've got a phone call here in just a few minutes, but yeah. listen, that was awesome. we got to do this again. I think we could dive in a lot deeper, and so if anybody's watching this that's interested, please let us know. Make a comment. We can, we can tie in some other ideas. If you have any other ideas that you'd like us to speak about, or you'd like Dr. Simmons to bring about, uh, especially digestive related or even autoimmune disease related because obviously the gut ties into the immune system so much and that's another thing i know he helps, helps a lot of people with but 
also, uh, so make a comment below. Also, if you'd like to schedule an appointment with Dr. Simmons and sit down and talk to him and actually let him uh, listen to you, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll put a link somewhere so you guys can do that too as well. Dr. Simmons, thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. All right, take care.